There's the pandemic, and then there are the ripple effects of the pandemic. Illness, for instance, that's going undetected and untreated. Surgeries canceled or delayed. For cancer patients, COVID-19 could not have come at a worse time. With us now for more from their respective hospitals in the downtown core of the provincial capital, we welcome Dr. Keith Stewart, director of the Princess Margaret Research Center and vice president for cancer at the University Health Network. And in North Toronto, Dr. Julie Halle, surgical oncologist and associate scientist at the Odette Cancer Center at the Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. We're grateful for the two of you taking away time from your normal responsibilities to join us and uh, help our viewers and listeners understand the situation in the province of Ontario right now. And just to set the table for our discussion, let's uh, put some facts and figures from Ontario Health on the record right now. This was the situation from March, middle of March to the end of May in 2020, last year during the first wave. And we saw that there was a significant decrease in screening for three major cancers in Ontario compared to the same period the year before in 2019. Let's get these on the record. There was a 97% decrease in screening for mammograms through the Ontario Breast Screening Program, an 88% de decrease in pap tests through the Ontario Cervical Screening Program, a 73% decrease in fecal tests through colon cancer check, there were 38% fewer cancer surgeries performed in Ontario in April 2020 compared to April 2019. That according to a study published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. Now that's all last year. These are stats from the first wave. Stuart, come on in here. Are you continuing to see these kinds of trends during this, the third wave now? Well, Steve, there's some better news here. I think during the uh, gaps between wave one and wave two and wave two and wave three, we were able to catch up with the screening services. Uh, I think uh, the latest statistics suggest that about 80% of pre-pandemic volumes uh, uh, screening activity is, is underway thanks to the good work of the, the team at Ontario Health. And there is some provincial variation, of course, as hotspots are less likely to be screening and, and quieter areas are more likely to be, but that has improved. Uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy really didn't slow down much during the pandemic, and, and I think we'll spend much of today talking about the impact on surgery, which is ongoing. Indeed. Okay. And I should have called you Dr. Stewart. Forgive me on that first, uh, That's all right. first time I, I referred to, to you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Halle, we've had uh, ICU doctors on the program discussing the potentially difficult decisions of triaging patients in critical care. Are these conversations that are occurring currently in cancer care as well? Yeah, absolutely. Those are occurring regularly in cancer care and they've been occurring for months now. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the triage in the ICU and the emergency department and rightfully so because those are very distressing decisions for both healthcare providers and patients and families who may have to be put through them if we get to that point. The important thing is we haven't gotten there. And the reason we haven't gotten to triaging in DICU is because we have been doing triage in other areas of the hospital for weeks and months now. We have to understand that healthcare system have finite resources. So to be able to work over capacity in ICU as we are right now, we are uh, redeploying a lot of resources from other areas of the hospital to the ICU. And because of that, we have to reduce our activity. So for the past weeks and even months, um, and even more so in the last two weeks, I would say all hospitals in Ontario are having weekly meetings to decide which surgeries will go ahead. Uh, only doing urgent surgeries. So this means that not everybody is able to have surgeries, but only the most urgent ones. Um, so to allow um, for ICUs to be able to care for everybody without triaging at this moment, um, the triage is already a reality upstream. Dr. Stewart, can you help us understand uh, how can you get that far behind in screening and then somehow in the midst of COVID-19 and even in a third wave, kind of catch up. There are finite resources. So how do you how do you eliminate that backlog? Well, uh, first of all, I want to reassure your, your listeners, Steve, that if you have cancer today, you will be looked after. If you need chemotherapy, if you need radiation therapy, if you need supportive care, uh, psychosocial oncology support, all of those services are still available and you will be offered them. With respect to surgery, there are definitely, as we've just heard, uh, need to uh, slow down surgical cases, so we preserve ICU beds. Um, we did try to catch up on surgery during the breaks. Uh, people were working on Saturdays, they were working overtime to try and address that backlog. 
Uh, unfortunately, for some areas like uh, screening, uh, there is still a very large backlog. I read something like 350,000 less mammograms across Ontario than in prior years. So people have been working hard and working overtime to try and catch up. But now we're in wave three. Of course, everything has slowed back down again. Dr. Halle, I, I think I really need clarification on this. The, the implication of all of those numbers that we just laid out on everyone sure seems to suggest that a lot of people are going to die of cancer that wouldn't have pre-pandemic. Is that not the case? It's very hard to know exactly what the repercussions are going to be. Um, I think there are concerns that the outcomes of patients will be worse than uh, they were pre-pandemic. This doesn't mean necessarily that more patients are going to die, uh, but more patients may have their cancer come back faster, or more patients may have um, functional impact, meaning they might need larger surgery or more extensive treatments because their cancers are diagnosed at a later stage than if they had been diagnosed through, through screening or because they couldn't get surgery in a timely fashion initially. So there might be an impact in terms of death going forward. There will be an impact in terms of quality of life. Uh, the repercussions of this can be massive. And at the moment, they are very, very difficult to predict because they will happen not in the immediate um, next few weeks, but it's gonna happen over the next few years. And so uh, this pandemic is gonna have very long lasting effects on, on Ontarians and all of Canadians. Well, again, Dr. Stewart, let me make sure I understand this. We, we are focused so deeply right now in our healthcare system on COVID-19 that people who are suffering from other things, as in cancer, are not getting the kind of uh, necessarily the kind of treatment or surgeries or follow up, etc., that they might have got under different circumstances. If we end up saving lives from dying of COVID-19, but end up losing them because people can't get treated for their cancer in a timely fashion, are we any further ahead? Well, look, the, the, the balance of looking after COVID versus looking after cancer is what we're here to talk about this morning. Obviously, there's concern that if you have to delay a surgery, um, there is an increased risk, perhaps, of the tumor metastasizing, for example. But everybody's working and doing their best to make sure that we stay within predefined um, timelines, for example, for surgery, that we don't broach those, that if there are people who are timing out, that they, they'll get dealt with and handled. A lot of the project, projections... Um, around, you know, people presenting with more advanced cancers or perhaps increased mortality. They are just that at this point. They're only projections. They're, they're, they're big concerns are valid, but uh, I don't think we've seen that yet. Uh, but as Dr. Hallett just mentioned, it, it's going to be a long process till we learn for sure the long-term consequences of this. Sure, but Dr. Halley, let me get you to comment on this. The Canadian Cancer Society just a couple of months ago uh, put out a study saying that a Canadian-led study published in the British Medical Journal shows that just a four-week delay, just a four-week delay in cancer treatment increases the risk of death by about 10%. And I gather you recently co-wrote a paper as well about the risk of postponing cancer surgeries. What's the big concern here? Yeah, to me, it, it is a real concern um, and it is difficult because it's only predictions at this point, as mentioned, but we, we do have a lot of evidence showing that delaying cancer care leads to worse outcome and worse outcomes mean more cancer coming back and eventually more death from that cancer. Um, one thing that's important, I think we just talked about the balance of COVID care versus cancer care, is that it's all linked together. So, you know, it's not about taking one away from the other. It's about being able to have a healthcare system that can look after all these patients. And that's why we need um, public health measures that are extremely strong. And we need to look at indicators beyond um, the COVID-19 ICU admissions. With regards to that, that study that we did, uh, what we saw is that there was a 60% drastic reduction in COVID and cancer surgery volume, pardon me, um, right after the first wave. And uh, that means that over 35,000 cancer related procedures were not done during the first wave. And what worries me with this is we tried to ramp up after that and to catch up, as Dr. Stewart mentioned, working weekends and overtime, but the ramp up was only 6% per week after that. So ramp downs are quick, ramp, ramp ups are slow. And I'm actually worried that adding the first wave, the second wave, now the third wave backlog, uh, we're not gonna be able to catch up for a long time. Hmm. Dr. Stewart, could you clarify for us what types of cancer treatments have had to be put on hold and what types are continuing as scheduled? 
Well, the, the main goal right now was to preserve intensive care beds. So any procedure which was uh, likely to result in use of an intensive care bed that could be deferred has been. So if it's a non-urgent uh, bone marrow transplant, if it's a surgical procedure that can be uh, delayed by a few weeks or a month, then those are the things that are being deferred right now. But I will emphasize again that we've really maintained a delivery of chemotherapy and radiation throughout the entire pandemic. That's still available. People can still access that. I think it is the surgical domain that's really most stressed. And that's because ORs have had to close so that uh, nurses and physicians can redeploy to intensive care units and, and so that we don't uh, fill the intensive care units up with uh, post-surgical cases. Dr. Halle, a real simple question. How are you managing? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm always surprised when people ask me that. Uh, even I would say patients will ask me that when I do virtual consultation with them and always takes me aback. I have to say, you know, as was said on, on your show by some of my colleagues uh, previously, the pandemic is tough on everyone. Lockdowns are horrible. Uh, we all hate them. And so it's difficult for everybody. Um, as cancer doctors, cancer surgeons, uh, right now, what's difficult is to see the amount of pressure that's being put on our patients and having to deliver those news and having to make decisions regarding care. We are trained to give the best to our patients, and right now we're not able to do that. Uh, we have to triage, and we do it gladly because we know that's what our colleagues in the ICU and in other regions of the hospital need to be able to care for very, very sick patients who did nothing to deserve COVID-19. But um, it, it is um, a big moral burden and, and um, can be distressful to have to go through this and, and try to support our patients with the resources we have. Yeah, and Dr. Stewart, we know that doctors have to make life and death decisions every day during normal times, and these are surely not normal times. How are you, how agonizing is it to try to have to make the decisions that you end up making now in this particularly difficult time? Well, it's been very stressful for our staff and for our patients. Uh, you know, patients' families can't come with them to appointments. They can't visit them in the hospital. Our staff are making uh, tough decisions. They have children at home as well as, as others. And um, it's, you know, obviously the stress and strain and the anxiety has been growing as the pandemic uh, has continued. And we've started to see some people struggle, uh, really struggling at this point. So the sooner this is over, the better, get vaccinated. Amen to that. Now, again, the Cancer Society, Dr. Stewart, says that four out of 10 cancers are preventable. How concerned are you that cancers that are normally pretty curable may not be detected early enough, and we're going to see a lot more carnage before this is done? Well, this is the whole issue around screening. So uh, obviously screening was one of the first things that closed down as sort of non-urgent. Uh, but really, as this drags on uh, and more and more people are missing their follow-up mammogram, their colonoscopy, uh, their FIT test, then uh, this becomes a worry that there are cancers out there. And we, we actually have the facts now. We know that there's less uh, cancers being diagnosed than we would predict, which means people are walking around with an undetected cancer. So we'd encourage you to get screened if you can, not this week or next week because we're in the middle of you know, wave three. But with, as soon as this starts to loosen up, please get screened, particularly if you have any concerns. Uh, if you felt a lump or you have unusual symptoms or you're losing weight, see your doctor, uh, go get your screening uh, taken care of as, as best you can. Now, I know you said don't do it this week because, of course, we're, you know, thick in the middle of this uh, third wave of the pandemic right now. But if if somebody were to find a lump in her breast while doing a self-examination in the shower today, how do you tell that person don't go for a screening right now. Wait a month or two before we're out of the, until we're out of this. Well, that person should get screened immediately. There's absolutely no doubt about it. If you have a concern, uh, there are ways that you can get screened now. There's, there's no um, inability to do that. You should see your doctor immediately if you have a concern. I guess I was referring more to people who are overdue for their mammography or, or other screening tests, and, and it can probably wait a few weeks. But I would encourage people to get back into the system quickly and get the screening levels caught up as best we can. It's going to be hard, even the backlog there is going to be hard to address because social distancing in our clinics means that um, you can't bring in the volume of patients you used to on a regular basis. But I know, I know for a fact the team Ontario Health is focused on this every day and they're working hard to bring up as fast as is safe uh, for our patients and, and to get this real concern about missed cancers uh, taken care of as best we can.
Good. I'm glad we clarified that then. Now, Dr. Halle, of course, I just asked a question about breast cancer, about which I think there is a pretty decent level of awareness in society. And there is, uh, you know, pretty strong infrastructure in the province of Ontario uh, in the health system to deal with. But there are other cancers that don't have the same visibility as breast cancer does. And I wonder how concerned you are that they may be even further sidelined because of all of what we've talked about here tonight. No, I think that's an excellent question. There's a lot of um, inequities that have been revealed right, with this pandemic, uh, if we think at society level. And I think it's the same in, in different areas. So in our field, uh, there are some cancers that are less common. I personally specialize in, in one of those cancers called neuroendocrine tumors. Um, they're uncommon. People don't know them well. Patients at the best of times experience delays in diagnosis, difficulties finding care teams and, and delays in treatment. So Yes, those delays and those difficulties are uh, heightened uh, by the pandemic and, and the difficulties accessing care and the availability of care at this moment. Um, so it is a concern, but at the end of the day, like Dr. Stewart mentioned, the most important thing is that hospitals are safe right now. We will look after you. We will care for you. We have extremely dedicated teams uh, that will do that. And even if we cannot necessarily do surgery immediately and have to delay it, as a team, we will be looking at ways to mitigate the repercussions of that. And I have to say, I hear Dr. Stewart uh, talk and I keep wanting to you know, thank all my medical oncology, radiation oncology colleague, all the, the therapists, the nurses that are working with us, trying to make plans for patients for whom we cannot necessarily get surgery right now so that they can be treated until we can get surgery to them. And it's really been a, a, a big team effort in, in that way. Well, since you say your specialty is one of the kinds of cancers that doesn't get a lot of attention, maybe we should use this opportunity because I suspect there are people watching or listening to us right now who don't know what endocrine cancer is. So what is it? Oh, thank you. Um, neuroendocrine tumor is actually an uncommon type of cancer that can be found anywhere in the body, but most commonly uh, in the intestine or the stomach or the large intestine. And uh, they're very slow growing tumors that can also produce hormones. Uh, so because of that, patients may feel all sorts of different symptoms, going from abdominal discomfort or cramps uh, to sometimes being flushed, having the entire face become red um, or having uh, diarrhea. So their diagnoses are difficult to get to. And if you're experiencing any of those, please uh, seek uh, advice from a healthcare provider. Okay, glad to get that on the record. Now. Dr. Stewart, one of the things that governments in the country during COVID-19 have proved is that uh, under certain conditions, they are prepared to spend a lot more money than under other circumstances to do what it takes to take care of business. So I'm wondering, can you put a price tag on how much it would cost to get rid of the backlog, which has been created by COVID-19 and which will presumably exist for who knows how much longer until we get through this third wave? You know, Steve, I wish I could. I, I have no idea. I think it's not going to be cheap, though. I, I do wonder, I worry about the collision of um, the backlog and then the need for our staff who are, you know, feeling a lot of uh, need to take some time off and, and vacation even uh, when this is over, that those two things are going to come to a head-to-head -head collision. The, the, the solution is going to be to develop more capacity in the system. It's going to be have, have more bet, but even before uh, COVID started. We had our beds were full, our operating rooms were full, our chemotherapy units were full. So to address the backlog, we we're going to need more beds, we're going to need more capacity in our chemotherapy units, we're going to need more operating time in, in the ORs, and that's going to be expensive. I, I couldn't possibly give you a number, but uh, the ministry will have to, I think, and we all realize that this isn't going to end the day that COVID goes away. We have that huge backlog to address, and it will no, take I, I, years. I appreciate that. And, and just to give people some sense of it, I think in the last Ontario budget, which of course just came out a few weeks ago, uh, they were allocating almost $70 billion for the whole healthcare system. Now, presumably to do what you're talking about and get rid of the backlog, I mean, what are we talking about? Another half billion, another billion, maybe more to deal with that? Again, I would just be guessing, but I would think it is in the billions, uh, not in the millions for sure. In the billions and not the millions. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's get some uh, facts again, straight on the record here. One of the reasons we're happy to have you in is that there's a lot of misinformation out there and we would like to get a few things clarified. So, okay, Dr. Halle, can, can a patient who is currently undergoing cancer treatment get a vaccine safely? 
Absolutely. Not only can they get the vaccine, they should get the vaccine and they should get the first vaccine they can get. Uh, all vaccines that are currently used in Canada are efficacious and safe, and the priority is to get it. Uh, if you're taking um, cancer-directed therapy, systemic therapy at the moment, sometimes the timing of the vaccine might have to be uh, adjusted based on when the last treatment was received, uh, but it can definitely be done, and it should be done, and it can be done safely. Uh, patients who are receiving active therapy, some specific types of active therapy, can also be eligible to receive the second dose of the vaccine in a shorter time frame um, and should uh, just talk with your healthcare provider about this to receive the necessary information um, and, and a letter to present the vaccine centers to, for that to happen. Now, Dr. Halle, I'm going to do a follow up here and don't think me impertinent for asking this question, please. But the question is, how do you know? Because presumably when they created this vaccine, I don't know how many you know patients who are receiving cancer treatment would have been part of the clinical trials. So how do you know that there's no potential adverse reaction if you're taking cancer treatment to getting a vaccine? So you are correct. Most uh, cancer patients taking active, active treatment were not part of the initial uh, trials that developed a vaccine. However, we have the chance now to have um, a lot of countries that have administered millions of vaccines uh, to all sorts of people, including cancer patients on active treatment. And so we have that data uh, coming out now showing that it is safe, uh, the side effects are not increased. The one information we got from that data, um, however, that was very useful in the vaccination strategy, I suspect, um, is that for cancer patients that potentially have um, a weakened immune system because of their treatments, they should receive the second dose uh, in a shorter time frame. So that means uh, within the time frame planned by the, the vaccine um, that were developed, so that's about 21 to 28 days as opposed to uh, the four months that is currently being done in Ontario. Um, so we have lots of data now because a lot of cancer patients have received the vaccines uh, in other parts of the world. Good, okay, good to clarify that. And what about one more follow-up here? What about patients who are in remission right now? Any issues with getting the vaccine for them? So the patients who are in uh, remission, it depends on the type of treatments that they are getting. Uh, some patients in, um, still get treatment for a long time after a cancer diagnosis and initial treatment. So they should get it. Um, like everybody else in the population, everyone should get the first vaccine available when their turn comes. Uh, however, I don't think that it will be eligible for a shorter time frame from second doses if they're not on active therapy. Okay. Dr. Stewart, let me ask you about screening right now. Are you satisfied that it is under all circumstances safe to get screened for potential cancer diagnosis right now? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the, the hospitals are safe. Uh, there are very rigorous uh, criteria for getting in the door through screening, uh, hand washing, uh, wearing a mask. Uh, so people should not be um, afraid of coming in for, for screening if they need it, particularly as we mentioned earlier, if they're concerned about something, they should feel comfortable coming into the, 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 the local screening center. Let me go at you on that one more time, because I don't have to tell you that there are there will be people watching and listening to this who are plenty nervous about going into a hospital where, you know, even under the best of circumstances, and again, these are not the best of circumstances, there's all sorts of superbugs and other things that live in hospitals that nobody wants any part of. You're convinced that there are, it is not an issue at all to go to a hospital and get a screening process right now. No, I am convinced, yes. I think, I'll, I'll, I think that we are as safe as we can be. Uh, again, I think if this is a, reg a routine mammogram, a routine screening test that you're coming for, there's, there's probably a ability to wait until the, the current pan wave three is settled down. Uh, but if you have any concerns whatsoever, you should feel perfectly comfortable coming into your screening center at the current time. Okay. Dr. Halle, in your view, how much influence do you think doctors have in convincing their patients to go in for a screening? I, I hope that we have some influence, um, but I, I think, you know, our, our main job is to support patients and answer their questions and, and help them understand what the risks and the benefits are. And and that's what that's what we're here for. And there's been a lot more of that sort of counseling and, and discussion happening in the pandemic. And the good thing is that now that we have a lot of virtual care, it's also easier to do so. Um, so that's one of the main things I've been doing with this pandemic in my clinics is reassuring my patients that coming for regular testing 
um, like for workup of a new cancer or for follow-up of a cancer that was resected previously uh, is safe. And that, that's a big part of our job. So I, I, I sure hope that that counseling part and, and taking the time to address patient question does have some influence and, and helps them make their decisions. Dr. Stewart, are you doing virtual conversations with patients as well? In fact, the whole of, uh, I think everybody is, but Princess Margaret probably is at 40 to 50% virtual consultation right now with all its uh, pros and minuses. It, it, uh, we, we've learned, uh, we published actually, that uh, we can save patients a great deal of time and money by doing a virtual consultation where it's feasible. But of course, there are instances where a physical examination is important and a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting is important. So it, right now, it's about 40 to 50% all virtual, and it's probably even maybe even slightly higher in the last few weeks. Well, I'm going to assume then, which is always dangerous, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to assume then that at some point along the way, you've had a patient say to you, um, you know, I, I know you want me to go in and get screened, but I just really don't feel comfortable going into a hospital right now with everything I'm hearing. How do you, how do you talk to that patient who, who shares that view? Yeah, well, I think in a follow-up to our previous, the previous question you asked, you know, I, I, I think speak to your physician. If you have hesitancy about screening and it's, it's time, uh, then talk to them um, and, and ask them, can this wait? Is this something I should get done right now? I mean, as you mentioned, the woman who feels a lump in her breast in the shower, absolutely, they should be in within a very short period of time of screening. If it's your uh, biannual mammogram and it's, it's a couple of months late, that's probably not going to be such a big issue. So uh, if you have concerns or hesitancy, I think have a discussion with your physician, ask them. All right. And uh, one more follow up, Dr. Stewart, and that is women who have just taken the COVID-19 vaccine, can they or should they get mammograms right away or wait? Again, if you have a concern, you should get mammogram right away. What, uh, what has been observed is that when you have the COVID vaccine or any vaccine for that matter, uh, you can get a normal uh, reaction within the lymph nodes under your arm. And on certain types of scans and mammograms, you, that can look like swollen lymph glands, which can be misleading. So we would encourage you, uh, first of all, don't delay if you have a concern, just tell the mammography center you had a vaccine and what arm it was in and how long ago you had it. Uh, however, if you can wait again and you've been vaccinated within the past couple of weeks, it's probably reasonable to put off mammography um, for a few weeks, maybe a month before you go for the, the procedure because it can cause a swollen and it's and lymph nodes and that's completely normal. In fact, it's, it shows your immune system is working well. Okay, we've got about five minutes left here and I'd like to spend that time picking uh, the brains of you two because at some point, the provincial government, once it gets past all this COVID-19 business, and who knows when that will be, but we hope sooner than later, uh, they're gonna need advice. They're gonna need advice on what needs doing, on how to reduce the backlog, on how to invest more in cancer screening and cancer care, cancer surgeries, and they're gonna need smart people like you to tell them what they ought to be doing. So Dr. Halle, let's start there. Um, let's get to the end of the third wave. What does the government of Ontario and health, uh, Ontario Health, what will they need to be doing at that point in order to get things back on track? I think that there's a few things. Uh, the first one is to get to the end of the third wave, we're gonna need much better public health measures um, so that we can really curb this pandemic down and we're able to get back to normal as soon as possible. So this means closing all non-essential businesses, all of them, uh, paid sick days that's been talked about a lot and, and other measures that will be necessary to get to the end of third wave. Once we get there will be what we talked about before with the, the budget piece is putting the resources uh, together so that we are able to catch up and um, trying to minimize the barriers to ramping up the activity for, for all of cancer care, including cancer surgery. And the one thing in all of that that I have to say we, we cannot necessarily measure or pay for is the workforce. It's the workers in there. So we can open up operating rooms, we can open up beds, we can um, have more ICU beds, more time, but we need people to be there and we need to be able to support those people because they're going to be an exhausted workforce that are going to have to work even more um, after the pandemic is over to catch up. Uh, so we'll need to minimize all the barriers to their work um, so that they can do it um, even if they're tired. We are just now seeing the first examples of 
uh, healthcare professionals from other parts of the country being flown into Ontario to assist in that regard. Do I assume that you would be open to seeing that significantly ramped up at some point? That could be a, a good idea. I, to be honest, I haven't thought of it um, so far. I was uh, in the mode of we need to get through this right now and get care for our patients at, at this exact moment. Uh, but yes, if we if we are doing this uh, to support ICUs, I don't see why it is not something that we could do in the future uh, to support ramping up of, uh, of surgical activity, for example. Uh, because opening operating rooms for Saturdays, Sundays, and evenings, um, it's fine, but you need um, surgeons, you need nurses, you need environmental services, you need PSPs, anesthetists, and uh, and those have a finite number of hours uh, in them that he can work and work well during. Gotcha. Okay, Dr. Stewart, you've got the ear of the health minister. What are you going to tell her? Well, first of all, I, I think people are exploring all of the options right now, including, but, but of course, remember that uh, bringing people from across the country isn't they're all going to have the same problem essentially is Ontario has been the worst but everybody everybody's been impacted so I'm not sure that's the solution I would say not not to assume when the the COVID pandemic dies down which it will uh, that uh, the we will not need the extra resources that the government have been very good at providing during the actual pandemic itself and it's going to take a couple of years of increased operating room time increased staffing increasing beds increased beds uh, to get that backlog addressed, and that, that would be my message. I'd also like the... to put up, sorry, go ahead, Steve. No, no, uh, but please follow up if you would. Well, the, the other point was a little bit more of a, uh, I think we have to look after our healthcare workers as well. And of course, they've been unable to get uh, their second shot of vaccines without waiting for four months. And I'd sort of like to advocate that we're going to ask these folks to go back and keep working even harder than they have during the pandemic after 14 months of this already. And uh, I think they need to feel safe in what they're doing. And right now they don't. We're seeing people develop COVID despite the first vaccine in the healthcare environment. And and I would really like to advocate that the frontline healthcare workers get their second shot sooner than four months after the first one. Here, here. Dr. Keith Stewart from Princess Margaret Hospital, Dr. Julie Halle from Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Really good of both of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Stay safe and thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.